If you missed it, we picked up another project for the channel. It's a four-door BMW E30, and I've got a lot of fun ideas for what we can do with it. There are, however, a few things we should probably get done first. You see, this car is as new to me as it is to you, so I think we should start by giving this car a proper inspection and learning a bit more about what I got myself into. I've noticed this trend recently. People try to be an expert the first time they do something. They'll hide the learning and the mistakes they made along the way, and they'll simply pretend they knew it all along. Could be image related, but who really knows? All I can really say is it's not my approach. To me, learning is the most fun part of the process. That idea goes for everything in life, including this new car. It's a new platform for me. So the first thing I did, and it's something I do with every new project car, is take some time to learn it. I tried to apply as much information as I already knew from working on other cars to learning this car. While I was doing this, I was also keeping an eye out for anything that I saw which was wrong. I came up with a list of issues and maintenance that this car was going to need before I do any sort of fun modification. This is definitely not an exhaustive list, but it's what I usually check for every car that I buy, and I actually found quite a bit to do. The weatherproofing seems to have shrunk a bit with age. Along with that, the rubber bushings on the top of the struts seem to have a few cracks in them. Nothing major though. The radiator hose also has a patch on it, but it's not leaking. The intake, however, is another story. Not a single part of the intake is actually attached. It's all just sitting here. I'm assuming someone had this off before I bought the car, and recently at that, and they didn't even put it back on correctly. On the other side, it looks like the valve cover gasket is also leaking. Not nearly as big a deal as this giant vacuum leak in one of the few vacuum lines this car does have. An easy fix though. I will say, at least the oil looks brand new. And that makes sense since the car came with paperwork proving that. Still good to double check. I also noticed that there seems to be a good amount of play in the throttle cable. It looks like it's adjustable, so I'll have to look into that. The suspension, brakes, and tires all look really good. There's a ton of tread and the pads and rotors are relatively new. Next to them, however, is the main area on this car with surface rust. I want to deal with this fast. I also noticed we're missing a center cap on one of these wheels, and a German car wouldn't be complete without a puddle underneath it. Thankfully, it's washer fluid, by far the best of the fluids to leak. With that, my preliminary inspection is mostly done, and I've now got a big list of things to do. I've given the engine a once over and an inspection, and it looks like we got a couple things that I want to address. I'd like to do valve cover gasket, intake, air panel filter, tighten up the intake, fix the vacuum leak. We'll do spark plugs, cap, rotor. I also want to look into the throttle cable and see if that is worth adjusting because it looks like there's quite a bit of slack there. So maybe there's a few extra hidden five or six horsepower in this beast of an engine. <laughs> Tires are new. Wheels are new. A couple things I want to do with that. I've never ran this brand or model of tire before, but they're nice enough that I don't really feel the need to change them immediately. So that's going to be lower on the priority list. Paint and rust is going to be pretty high on that because the small surface rust, even though it's minor, is something I really want to take care of preemptively. So if that means we're getting a paint job sooner than later, that means that. Or one option is wrapping the car. I know Vivid is more than willing to help us out with that. And it'd be cool because we could test out some of their new products on it. It wouldn't be a forever thing. It would be until I can save up and find a place that will accurately match this paint code and get us a worthwhile paint job, as opposed to like now going and buying a Mako paint job, because quite frankly, I think this car deserves a little more than that. So it's looking like we got a good list of stuff that we want to fix. So I say we get started. This is one of my favorite phases of a new project. You've got a big list of things it needs and an even bigger box of parts. Oh, 
Oh, I can't even tell you how excited I am to work on this car for the first time. It's a big old box of parts, and in it is everything we're gonna do today. Basically, we're doing all the basics, centering mostly around the engine bay, with the exception of one or two small fixes. We're gonna take these one fix at a time, starting with the missing center cap. The cool thing about these wheels is that you can actually just buy the center caps online, and they're not even that expensive. They also just pop into place. So with about two minutes of my time, I was able to dramatically improve the wheel setup this car has, since they all match now. Next, I wanna hop into the engine bay. This is a vacuum line, and compared to a turbo car, this is one of the only vacuum lines this engine has. Perks of being naturally aspirated. I don't think this hole's supposed to be there though, so we might as well replace it. I don't have this exact type of hose, but I do have a box filled with a bunch of miscellaneous vacuum lines, and I think one of these is gonna work. I don't have a color scheme in mind for this engine bay yet, so we're gonna go with a black vacuum line, and it turns out I have ones that look like they're gonna work. So this fix is as simple as cutting them to be the same length and throwing them on. With that all sorted, let's take a look at this mess of an intake. Like I mentioned, none of this is attached. The hose clamps are loose, the tubes coming in from the grill aren't lined up, and I have no doubt that the filter that's in here wasn't serviced for a long, long time. This metal box on the intake is called an airflow meter, an AFM for short. Serves a similar purpose to a mass airflow sensor, but it's a little bit older. There are four clips holding the top of the airbox on, two of which were actually hooked, and without the cover, we can now get to the filter, which is properly crushed. Here's where things get a little interesting. Now would be a fantastic time to upgrade this with a cone filter, but for this car, I don't think that's a great idea. The E30 bay gets notoriously warm, hence why the stock airbox is basically a cold air intake already. I reinstalled this plastic piece, which directs air directly from the front of the car, through the panel filter, and into the intake manifold. While we could easily throw a cone filter on there, it's just gonna cause heat soak, so I think the best option is to rebuild this stock intake and upgrade the filter. I'm also using mass airflow sensor cleaner on the inside of this box to get all the dirt out. I chose this because then you don't have to worry about any liquid remaining and it's already rated for going into the intake track in case it does. So we should be good to go. And I'm not trying to make this perfect. Remember, right now is all about making improvements, not perfection. I tossed in the lower part of this intake and I intentionally attached it, unlike what it was before. Here's a great look at why the stock E30 intake is actually really good. The air that comes through here comes directly from the front part of the grill, so it's as cold as it can possibly get. And before I took this apart, this tube wasn't even installed, so it should work a lot better. And since the filter was properly crusty, I figure it was also a good time to upgrade it. This is a high flow panel air filter. First things first, I don't expect this to double or triple the horsepower this car has. This is just an air filter which gets us slightly more flow. If anything, in conjunction with a properly fitted intake, I think we're gonna get some better throttle response since, you know, the intake's no longer clogged with its own tube. Plus, it would be a shame to throw a crusty filter on a properly cleaned intake. Before installing the top, I gave it the same cleaning treatment that I gave the bottom. We'll do a full engine bay detail at a later time. This episode's all about functional improvements. While I do this, I also thought it was a good time to talk about belts. I looked at both the serpentine and timing belts, and both of them look really good. Another perk of buying a car with so much documentation is that I can tell exactly when they were replaced, both of which about 10,000 miles ago, which isn't too bad at all. Now that the AFM is a little bit cleaner, I'm ready to actually install it. And unlike before, I'm going to attach it with all four clips and tighten both of the hose clamps. Should be a pretty good airflow improvement. Now that we've spent some time on the intake side of the engine, I think it's time we give the exhaust side some attention. The valve cover itself doesn't look too terrible. However, the gasket is actually leaking. Whoever did it last used way too much RTV and there's chunks of it everywhere. So now is the perfect time to replace it. And unlike my Audis, on this car, it's a seriously quick job. You've got to remove a bracket connecting the valve cover to the intake manifold and one single hose clamp. Then you're already at the stage where you can remove the bolts holding the valve cover on. This is also 
also going to be a really fun opportunity to look at the head of this engine. This car is over 30 years old, so I'm really curious what it's going to look like in there. You can tell quite a bit about how a car was cared for, or if it was for that matter, by looking underneath the valve cover. If the engine overheated at some point in its life, it'll be pretty discolored. If there's a ton of sludge, you know that the oil wasn't really changed very regularly. And if there's a bunch of metal, we've got a large problem. Overall though, this car runs really well, so I'm curious what we're going to find. Well, that wasn't what I was expecting, but in a very, very good way. Everything in here is basically brand new, which is exceptionally cool. What's not as cool is the amount of leftover silicone everywhere where this valve cover is supposed to seat. RTV gasket maker is nice, but you need to use it sparingly. If you use too much of it, it tends to create an uneven surface, which causes it to leak. And that's what I believe has happened here. It's hard to see on video, but there's a layer going across pretty much the entire head of the engine. It was practically gluing the two half moon gaskets on either side of the engine. Once they were out, I spent a long time using a razor blade to clean up the entire gasket surface. That way, it's actually going to seal. At this time, I also use some degreaser to clean up the valve cover a little bit. I just want to remove the oil stains. Now that this is all clean, we're ready to install the gasket. We are going to use some RTV, but not nearly as much as what was on there. I put a really small layer on these half moon gaskets, and that's honestly just because I've always been taught to do that. Not nearly as much as was on there though. Whoever installed the gasket last time put RTV around the entire thing, and I'm guessing that's why it was leaking since the gasket wasn't designed for that. Yeah, we're not doing that. We're just going to toss the gasket on like we're supposed to. It goes on, followed by the valve cover, and then you have a torque ritual to make sure that it seats properly. Anytime you tighten anything you want to seal, you need to make sure that you alternate what you're tightening. We're starting in the middle and alternating out in a four point star pattern, and we're making sure we're torquing it down equally. That way it's not going to leak at all, and I'll be a happy camper. I'll throw all the torque sequences and the torque order in the description. Now that the valve cover is taken care of, we've got pretty good access to our spark plugs, so we might as well take a look. I always replace spark plugs every time I get a new project, and this one is no exception. I think of this as preventative maintenance. If we ever run into issues down the line, it's nice to know that the ignition system was recently updated, so we can almost pre-eliminate that as a potential cause, making the car easier to diagnose. Here's a new plug next to the old one, and it's a lot less crusty. I checked the gap on all of the new plugs to make sure it was proper, and then I twisted off the end, which we have to do because all new spark plugs are designed for ignition coils. And this car doesn't actually have those. And I'll explain all that in just a little bit. For now, we're just gonna focus on replacing all the spark plugs. Thankfully, none of ours were broken, and they all had roughly the same amount of wear, which are both good signs. I'm still gonna replace them to be consistent though. And since this is a naturally aspirated straight six, it's super simple. They're all right here. I broke them all loose and then prepped all of the brand new plugs to make sure they were all the proper gapping and the ends were all removed. I like to do them all at once to make sure that I don't forget anything. After that, it's as simple as replacing the old with the new. There was nothing super new about doing spark plugs on this engine as opposed to the ones I've done in the past. The only real difference is on those other engines, the spark plugs sink into holes in the valve cover. So these ones are a lot easier to get to.
At this point, all the spark plugs have been replaced, and with that, I can breathe a sigh of relief. However, on all my other cars, when I do the spark plugs, I've always done the ignition coils at the same time. This car doesn't have those though. To understand what this car has, let's talk about what ignition coils are. Ignition coils are driven by the computer, and all they do is take the signal from the computer and make the spark plug spark. They are electrically driven. This car is mechanically driven. It has something called a distributor cap and rotor. This is the replacement cap for reference. Each one of these holes at the bottom goes directly to a spark plug. All that connects them is a wire. On the inside of the cap, you can see these metal prongs. Each one of these goes to one of the holes on the bottom of the cap. The rotor is this small piece which sits on the inside and rotates. There's a little piece of metal on the end. So every time it passes one of the prongs on the cap, it sends a signal down that respective wire, causing that spark plug to spark. That rotor is attached to the engine itself so it is mechanically driven. Together, the cap and rotor effectively do the same thing that ignition coils do. So in your mind, you can categorize replacing your cap and rotor as a similar upgrade to upgrading your ignition coils. And that's what we're doing right now. The stock cap is attached with three bolts on each side of its loosely triangular shape. They're a little hard to get to, but they're not impossible. With all the bolts undone, I figured it would be best to transfer all of the wires to the new cap before we removed the old one. It's important to get these right because they directly correlate to the cylinder firing order, so they need to be in the same spots. They are labeled to make it easier though. Another cool thing is the bolts that go through the cap keeping it in place can't actually fall out, so one less thing to worry about there. Here's the old one and you can see why we replace it. There's metal buildup on each of the prongs and if that gets too bad it can cause issues. Here you can see me removing the stock rotor. There are three really tiny allen bolts that like to strip keeping it in place, but if you're careful they come off easily. And the cool thing is, since there's three bolts, you don't have to worry about aligning this properly. It's just as simple as taking the three bolts off, putting the new piece on, and tightening the three new bolts. Super cool to learn how all this works. And with the new rotor in place, we can go ahead and reinstall the new cap. I found it easiest to alternate between all three of the bolts and slowly tighten the cap on there to make sure that it was seated flush and flat. This is one of those things that you want to be tightened as symmetrically as possible. With the ignition system serviced, I went ahead and threw on the plastic cover again. But then I noticed that the puddle from earlier was getting worse. Super cool. It's not exactly a slow leak anymore, and this car has a lot of washer fluid. I tracked the leak down to the reservoir itself. There was a small crack on the bottom, so we're gonna need to find a new one. I didn't wanna waste the fluid that was in it, so I decided to pour it into a bucket. This car has a lot of room around the exhaust manifold, so it was pretty easy. Who knows what the future holds for this car though. Maybe someday there'll be a little less room over here. With the fluid saved, we'll have a check engine light until we get a new one, but for now, it's not gonna leak everywhere. Or at least it'll leak a lot less. I also went ahead and addressed the weatherproofing. It's rubber, so it shrinks with age. You can't really unshrink this weatherproofing, so for now, what I did was cut it in the corner so it would stay flat. It holds up the headliner, so every time I open the door, it falls down and pulls the headliner with it. We'll find a replacement. So now that it's staying up there, this is definitely an improvement. Another quick modification I did was related to the clutch. This car has a crazy amount of clutch travel, and really only the top three-fourths of it are useful. This is a quick modification called a clutch stop. All it is is a little spacer that sits at the very bottom. It's length adjustable and allows you to remove a lot of the dead travel at the bottom of your clutch. In other words, you can shift a ton faster. At first glance, you wouldn't think this is a super cool upgrade, but man, do you notice it while shifting. It basically takes a fourth of the pedal travel away every time, and that brings 
brings me to the final change I made to this car, removing the temporary plates and putting on the real one. I saved this for last because now that I've actually worked on the car, it finally feels like it's mine. And I'm sure that's just going to feel more and more true the more work we do to this thing. I am very curious what you guys suggest and want to see out of this build. I've got a lot planned already, but I also want your suggestions, especially related to that surface rust issue. I want to get that fixed as soon as possible, so if anybody has suggestions or has dealt with it before, let me know. I am all ears. With that though, we were ready to start the car up. It's always a little stressful to fire a car up after doing this much work to it. Thankfully, it was as happy as ever. The idle was normal, we didn't have a misfire, but we did cause a check engine light, which which brings me to my favorite part of the interior, or at least something I think is really cool. So without scanning this car, how would someone be able to tell what this light means? Well, the car has a built-in decoder on the roof. Each light corresponds to something the check engine light could mean. The brake light one turns on every time you start the car, and after you press the brakes, it goes away. All we've got left is the washer fluid, which makes sense. The SRS on the left with the tape over it was from the previous owner. That one's flashing because it has an aftermarket steering wheel. Well, one from a different car, that is. I took the car for a quick drive around the block to make sure that everything was good to go, and it felt better than ever. The throttle does feel quite a bit less lazy, and the engine seems to rev just a little bit faster. In other words, I think everything we did today was a success. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider dropping a like and subscribing for more. It's the best way you can help support me and my content. I've got a ton planned for the channel. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day.